The reason sexual health is health is because it's a huge part of your mental health. We spend a lot of time thinking about sex, maybe participating in sex, wanting sex. And when you have a problem in the sexual department, no matter who you are, it affects your brain. Stress and anxiety and depression, they all affect your ability to have normal sexual function. So that's what we say, it's a biopsychosocial model. Dr. Rena Malik is a board certified urologist with extraordinary contributions in the realm of urology. She has a prolific portfolio boasting over 80 peer reviewed publications and she's also the online content editor for the Journal of Urology and Urology Practice Journals. And to top it all off, she has over 300 million views and 1.9 million subscribers to her YouTube channel. So I've been following you for quite some time now and you are sharing some of the most important, taboo and critical things for human health, you know, for all of us in regards to sexual health. And it's so enlightening. And there's these all these little questions that you have kind of ran, rattling around the back of your mind that you address and share with everybody. And I wanna know what got you interested in this field and specializing in sexual health? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your compliments. But so I'll start with, you know, generally speaking, how I got into urology. You know, you go into medical school, you decide you want to be a doctor. I had no idea I wanted to be a surgeon or a urologist. I didn't even know what urology was. But I ended up liking surgery and I was sort of hesitant. I was like, I'm not, I don't see myself as a surgeon. But my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, was like, you know, you get trained for a reason. So I looked at the surgical subspecialties and urology is something that, you know, you find, you find your tribe when you're training. And so I found my tribe. These are people who did great work, were super innovative, but also didn't take themselves too seriously. Like when you're dealing with genitalia all day, you just can't. Right. And so I liked that. And I found myself feeling like, you know, I don't have any taboos about talking about this stuff. I feel comfortable talking about genitalia and examining it and talking to patients. And so I went with it. And then as I was in training, I realized that, you know, it was more than just learning to be a surgeon, right? It was also learning to be able to communicate with mm, your patients. Right. And so I remember very distinctly having a patient where we did this beautiful surgery on her. And after the surgery, she had to actually catheterize herself in order to empty her bladder. She had to put a little tube in to empty her bladder. And she didn't really understand that completely. So she kept getting readmitted to the hospital because she wouldn't do it often enough. And I realized then that it doesn't matter how perfect we are technically, but if our patients don't understand us or they maybe don't take our advice uh, the first time in that 15 minutes we get to talk to them, then we're doing a disservice, yeah. you know? And I found also patients were coming to me with really things that they could have tri trialed and uh, tried and figured out on their own, like maybe cut back on your caffeine a little bit, maybe don't drink a gallon of water a day, you know, and, and they could have tried those things instead of having to wait in my office, find parking, do all these things to come see me. And so I wanted to offer that education to people to empower them. Mm. So that's really what the catalyst was for you to start teaching direct to camera. You've got millions and millions of views on your videos was inspired by you working with patients and just knowing like a lot of people just don't know this stuff. Yeah. So interestingly, you know, I never thought I was going to be an influencer or a YouTuber, but I wanted to make this content. So I just started, right. I ripped off the bandaid. I started making content about overactive bladder, but I realized that as I was talking about things, people would ask questions about sexual health. And I found that there was such a lack of understanding about sexual health, not just in the United States, but around the world. And people were desperate for this information and they wanted answers to questions that we weren't answering for them. Like, how do I make my penis bigger? Or, you know, how can I have an, a, you know, a, a stronger erection? Or how can I have a better sex drive, right? And these are the questions that they were asking their doctors and sometimes getting dismissed, or they weren't even getting to their doctor to talk about it. Yeah, yeah and then they go to the internet mm -hmm. and <laughs> end up buying some contraption. Right, um, or some something that, they, that proves that they're gonna get the best sex of their life and it doesn't work, right? Yeah, yeah. If you could, I'd love to start off by talking a little bit about why this subject matter matters, right? Mm -hmm. Sexual health is a huge aspect of being human. Like mm -hmm. it's the reason we're here right? in the first place, so it kind of matters. But there's so much data now affirming how good sexual health directly 
correlates with longevity, directly correlates with good mental health, and list goes on and on. Let's talk a little bit about why this subject matter matters. Yes, it absolutely matters. So we like to say sexual health is health, right? When you have normal functioning genitals, right, that fill with blood, that have good sensation, that respond appropriately to erotic stimuli, that tells you a lot about your overall body, right? That you have good vascular blood flow, that you have, you know, intact nerves, that you don't have anything going on in the background that might be creating an issue. And very often we're seeing it in the genitals before we see it elsewhere. So we like to say for men that erectile dysfunction is the canary in the coal mine. So when you start having trouble with erections, or maybe you're not getting that more erection that you used to get as often as you used to, it might be a sign that blood flow is decreasing. And you're going to see it first there because the arteries to the penis or the clitoris for women, for example, are you know, one to two millimeters, whereas arteries to the heart are three to four millimeters. So you're going to see problems manifest themselves in your sexual life before you do in your heart, for example, for chest pain. Mm, wow. So our bodies are literally giving us physical feedback if we're paying attention. Um, so mentioning blood flow, so would, what would be the equivalent for women erectile dysfunction? So it would be the sensation of a decrease of arousal. So arousal for women is, you know, having good lubrication. And that's not always the case. I don't want people to feel like if they don't have enough lubrication, it's just because there's something wrong with blood flow. It could be a hormonal issue, but certainly lubrication, having that sensation of like uh, feeling the pressure in your genitals where it's feeling more engorged. So that sort of sensation being not as prominent as it used to be potentially. Now with the blood flow correlation, and you mentioned this just a few minutes ago, is this similar? So is there arousal that's seen with the clitoris? Let's just talk about the clitoris. Let's yes. have a clitoris masterclass. Yes, let's do it. So the clitoris is the homologue of the penis. So when you look, think about embryology or the way we're developed, when you look at a feet like a embryo, you have what's called a genital tubercle. And that in the male becomes the penis and in the female becomes the clitoris. And if you take an anatomic section of the clitoris and the penis and you cut them down the middle, you're going to see they look exactly the same. They are two cylindrical bodies that fill with blood and gorge with blood and are basically a long shaft. So what you see of the clitoris, you're just seeing the head, you're just seeing the glands, just like the glands of the penis. So that's what you see visibly, but then deep inside you're, you're getting the shaft of the clitoris and then it, it separates to get the crura. The men have it too. It separates to the crura. And so that's sort of the exact anatomical homologue. It's just displayed differently, right? External genitalia look differently, but the erotic tissue is the same. Holy moly. And also I'm thinking about the the, the hood mm -hmm. as yep. well. Like the prepuce of the male or like the foreskin of the male. So same exact thing. And interestingly, what a lot of people don't realize is that women also can sort of pull that back and clean under it because sometimes they can develop smegma or sort of dead skin cells or oils that sort of get stuck between the clitoral hood and the clitoris that can then create discomfort, pain, maybe muted orgasms. So we're not taught this in anatomy class. We're rarely taught anything at all all in oh, elementary man. school, right? <laughs> but you're not really taught this. And so it's important to understand the anatomy and that's going to be your key, right? You can understand yourself, explore yourself, and then you can explore your partner because now you, you know, the anatomy is essentially the same. It's just slightly in a different location. All right. I just flashed back to that middle school yeah. sex ed class <laughs> that I had. And we were explicitly told that the vagina was... Mm -hmm the sexual organ, mm -hmm. right? The clitoris wasn't even in the conversation. Nope. And so with this being said, this being the equivalent, so this would automatically for us have a light bulb go off that this is the organ of pleasure. Yes. Absolutely. And it's the only organ in the entire human body that's only for pleasure, right? The penis has the urethra, the urine comes out of there. So the clitoris is literally only there for pleasure. There is no other purpose of the clitoris. And so it's a shame that we don't even get taught that, right? That is the only organ. So the vagina, you know, is, is essentially underneath the clitoris, right? So absolutely women get pleasure from stimulation of the vagina because the clitoris sits right on top of it. There's also different 
different nerve endings and things sort of areas like the G spot or the cervix that have nerve endings that can be seen felt as pleasurable when stimulated. And so definitely it can be an organ of pleasure, but the clitoris is the most direct route for pleasure. So it's as if for, for our male listeners, if someone stimulated your scrotum, yeah, maybe it'd feel good, but it's not going to feel as good as if someone stimulates your penis. So similarly, sort of that's the analogy. Now, with this being said, and the clitoris being the hub of, you said something so remarkable, exclusively for pleasure. There's no other organ in human anatomy that is just about pleasure. Now, this is a big question here, and I know that there isn't a cookie cutter answer for this, but if we can just get into the majority conversation, how do we go about pleasuring the clitoris? Yeah, so... Think about how, you know, everyone sort of has a different pressure sensation, pressure threshold, but you need stimulation of the clitoris. So that can be light touch, that can be firm touch, that can be vibration, that can be using oral sex. I mean, a whole variety of things, but the key is communication, right? Because just like, um, you know, things will work for the majority of men, Things will work for the majority of women, but everyone's a little different, right? And if you've had enough sexual partners, you'll know that there's someone who likes this and someone who likes that. And so you got to talk to each other and be like, what do you like? What, you know, and, and we need to normalize asking and also telling or, or even non-verbally telling, right? Like move a little this way or move a little that way or whatever it is, but just sort of being open to exploration and talking about it and playing, right? Because it's supposed to be fun. And so like, I think those things are really valuable and important to really figure out what is the stimulation that your individual partner likes. And it might, you might not get it right the first time or a couple times or here or there. It might not work exactly the way you want it to, but as you learn your partner and you get experience with that, then you can sort of, you know, decide what works better. And and I think always keep some diversity, keep some variability. You don't want to keep serving up the same script every time. Oh, don't want to watch the same rerun over and over <laughs> yeah, again. Yeah. Um, now, with this being said, the communication part, you know, I know people, obviously we have very diverse ways of communicating. So I would imagine that different contexts would be helpful with communication. Some people, it might be on the ground training as it's going down. Some mm -hmm. people outside of the act, you know, maybe you're having dinner, maybe you're just hanging out and you're talking about it. Yeah. Can you talk about well, that? We, you know, what we say in sexual health is like foreplay starts at breakfast, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're not just, sex is not just the only place where you're sort of building up pleasure. You should be building up that flirtation, that discussion, potentially earlier in the date or whenever you're with your partner. So that there's some anticipation, some excitement going into it, but also, you know, it's, I think it's really you know, empowering to tell somebody what you're into, or even ask them, what are you into? Right. And that can be outside of the bedroom and probably it's better to be outside the bedroom. Right. Because then it puts people sort of more insecure if you're doing it, you know, right before, like, you're like, yeah. Oh, I'm really into this. And you're like, I wasn't mentally prepared for that. Right. So, <laughs> so sort of like actually, you know, before you get into the bedroom, maybe when you're in the car or when you're sitting at the dinner table or wherever you find it comfortable, just to, you know, sort of broach the subject and everyone's going to respond a little differently. And if they've never talked about sex before, they may respond negatively, but I think you'd be like, look, I'm just trying to make sure that we have the most fun possible. And I'd love to know more about what, you like. And I think making it a non-threatening sort of just open-ended way. And if they don't respond appropriately, maybe you try again later. Right. Um, but, but certainly just trying to build that up so that you guys can both have a, or multiple partners for whatever, you know, whatever you're into, like can have an open discussion about what sort of you enjoy and what your partner enjoys and what your expectations are and that sort of stuff. Awesome. Um, so I, you, I have you here, so I'm going to ask a question. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a certain spot on the clitoris that might be, you know, more acclimated towards pleasure, towards orgasm? Um, 
Is that is that a thing? Well, generally, the the, the visible part of the clitoris is very um, sort of the most sensitive part, just like the glands or the head of the penis is is very sensitive. Uh, so yeah, that tends to be the easiest and most reliable route to orgasm. Now the G spot, which is sort of in the vagina, but also is part of, it's not a spot. Let's, let's uh, reframe. It's an erogenous zone. It's mis, mis, misnomer called the G spot. It's a, an erogenous zone. So it's an area where it's underneath the clitoris. So you're getting some stimulation of the clitoris. There's also the skein's glands, which are the homolog, again, that same word to the male prostate. And so that has some nerve endings that are pleasurable. And then the, the distal third of the vagina has the most nerve endings. So basically it's about two to three centimeters in the vagina on the anterior wall. And so that area can be quite pleasurable for some people, but it's not always going to be as reliable and not everyone's going to have an orgasm with stimulation of the G zone, but it is something that you can experiment with. Okay. So to break this down, mm -hmm. all right, so the, the G spot, i.e. this erogenous zone, Correct. the general location of this, you said the anterior side, so this is the, the belly top. side, yep. mm -hmm. right? And two to three inches in. Mm -hmm. And so I would imagine there are a variety of ways that you could interact with that area. Yeah. Like, how should, what are some ways to go about that? So it can be obviously uh, through manual stimulation is probably what people talk about most sort of like introducing some sort of digit and then manually stimulating that area. It can be with a toy. It can I love be- love how you said digits. <laughs> <laughs> we got to make it medical, you yes. know? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it can be with a toy and there's toys that are sort of like shaped in certain ways to stimulate that area. Um, it can be with your, you know, your phallus. And so a variety of different ways, but again, experimenting and vibration is always a really great tool. Mm -hmm. It actually has been shown to improve orgasmic intensity, to improve satisfaction. And so it's great to bring accoutrements to the bedroom if you feel comfortable. And, you know, I think it's sort of fun to experiment with different types of things and and it may allow for more pleasure. And if you are really someone who enjoys seeing your partner have pleasure, then that may also be a great way. And they can show you too. You can watch them stimulate themselves to, to decide what is actually really enjoyable for them. So then you know how to emulate that. Amazing, amazing. I wanna talk about this because, you know, a lot of the conversation regarding health, especially in conventional medicine, is focused on the, the male. Mm -hmm. and erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And it's ridiculous how this isn't discussed. In, and this is why your work is so remarkable because you're addressing these issues and talking about women's health and sexual health and sexual dysfunction. Yeah. So I'd love to talk a little bit about some of the common issues that women deal with regarding sexual dysfunction and of course, talk about some solutions as well. Absolutely. So the most common one that we hear about is low sex drive or low libido. And actually, when you look at survey studies or studies where they've you know inquired about how many percentage of women have low libido, it's up to 40%. So that's pretty high. But it's not that all 40% of those women are feeling bothered by it, right? It's usually about 12% that experience some bother associated with low desire. And there's other buckets of sexual dysfunction too, right? There's difficulty with orgasm or maybe not having an orgasm at all. There's difficulties with arousal, which are less common, but they do occur. So we see it a lot in men, obviously with erectile dysfunction, but with women, it's, a, it's usually less common. We typically end up focusing on libido orgasm issues. There can be pain issues um, that occur, you know, with intercourse and pain is never normal. Let me just say, you should never be told to go drink a glass of wine or relax or whatever that's if it's painful it's it's not right and, and that should be addressed um so so those are sort of the common buckets that we're seeing and they all have sort of different causes and treatment options but a lot of it you know and then a lot there's a lot of it's sort of biopsychosocial so it's not always just a mm -hmm. biologic problem right and i think i wanted to mention that earlier too that the reason sexual health is health is because it's a huge part of your mental health too so we spend a lot of time thinking about sex, part maybe participating in sex, wanting sex. And when you have a problem in the sexual department, no matter who you are, it affects your brain. So I tell everybody, it doesn't matter if you 
are just having an issue because your hormones are off or because your blood flows off, you're still going to have a problem in your brain because it's stressful, right? When you, when something's not working the way it should, and you're seeing people on the media, like have orgasms within minutes and having this amazing sex. And you're like, man, why is that not me? Right. And what's wrong with me? Am I broken? Like that's, that's in your head and that's going to affect your ability to perform. Stress affects your ability to have sex, stress and anxiety and depression. They all affect your ability to have normal sexual function. So that's why we say it's a biopsychosocial model. Right. Wow. And it feeds into each other. It becomes a vicious circle. Um, I, I don't think that the, it's so obvious, but it's not talked about enough. And I know that a lot of couples experience this and how stress, especially for women, can suppress that desire, right? Absolutely. And just like, I, I have a friend of mine who's been on the show multiple times, uh, Shalene Johnson. And she, she had some analogy of like, if I've got piles of laundry and, you know, the kids need to be taken to such and such and this other kid, we got an appointment at this time and I got to, and I haven't even taken a shower and all the things, how on earth am I going to be wanting to, you know, full on have sex and be interested in sex when I've got all this mental stuff that's weighing me down? Absolutely. And the thing about it is interesting because women look at stress, I mean, look at sex as a, another burden sometimes or as another chore, whereas we, men tend to look at it as a stress relief. And so there's actually data that shows that. And so that's a real challenge is like, how do we get people in the mind frame that sex is supposed to be fun and enjoyable and a time to relieve stress, not a chore, right? And so there's actually really excellent work by Lori Brado, who's a sex researcher in Vancouver, looking at mindfulness and how that impacts libido and, and overall sexual satisfaction. They found that women who do participate in mindfulness and men have better sex drives and overall improved quality of life because of that. And so it's a huge problem, right? And the, the stressors are just getting more and more, right? Mm, because I think right, yeah. like when you and I were growing up, I didn't do a ton of sports and, and, and activities, I, you know, one thing, right? And, and I didn't have, my parents didn't worry that much about it because they're like, oh, she's doing fine. But I feel like now there's like all these pressures. You have kids, you gotta take them to this activity, that activity, this activity, keeping up with the Joneses, whatever it is, right? And everything's on social media. So you feel this like, this desire to have some visual aspect to your life, which is stressful. And everyone's stressors are different, right? But there's financial stressors. There's a whole bunch of things that people are dealing with that make it really hard for them to then enjoy this moment, which is supposed to be intimate and pleasurable. Yeah. And then that creates discord between relationships and nobody wants to address that discord or talk to their partner because they feel shut down or they feel upset or they feel not heard. And so there's a lot of it that comes from relationship issues. And it's a real, um, it's a real challenge. All right, I'm gonna ask you the, the biggest question of our day. Yeah. How do people deal with all this stress so that they can have better sex? I'm just gonna throw this out here. I've been a big proponent because I'm aware of this. I proactively look for ways to take things off my wife's plate. That's like, awesome. I find little creative ways to, Yeah. The only thing is like challenging myself sometimes to not say it, that yeah. I'm doing the thing. Like, babe, it's hard. hey, I need some points. I'm about to go do this, whatever, <laughs> you know, adding up the points. You know, we jokingly, she'll, you know, deduct points from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, just knowing that, you know, today there's just, like you said, there's so much going on, so many new stressors and, you know, her just wanting to be able to focus on her own wellness and just like, proactively as a partner, just finding ways to help to support her in her having um, th the conditions where she can de-stress, uh, process things, you know, have a moment to herself, all these things I've picked up on doing over the years. Absolutely. And that's one of the ways, right? Like I think whether you can or can't do those things, you can certainly try to support her in other ways. So say you don't we have the time to do certain chores or certain activities that your partner's doing, or you just don't find them as valuable. So I'll give you an example. My husband will be like, you want to take the kids to do this activity. I don't think it's necessary. Like, 
that's then that's your responsibility. And I, I will respect that. Right. Um, so it depends on where you're at. But I would say that in terms of figuring out ways, innovative ways to make things easier. Right. So whether it's buying a Roomba to like vacuum the floors that does it by itself. Right. Or hiring someone once a month or once a week or whatever to come clean your home, whatever it is that you can afford that's reasonable or, you know, go having her her family or your family come over and watch the kids, whatever it is. But taking off some of that responsibility responsibility is absolutely helpful. And I, I joke with my husband, there's like these, you know, we sh share memes on, you know, social media. And mm -hmm. some of the memes that women relate most to are when they see an attractive man doing household chores. And we all joke <laughs> that that's so hot, right? Because it's like, that's really what gets women excited. It's like, yo, you're helping out. It's not that the, the chore is really that exciting. It's the fact that like someone's recognizing you, seeing you and doing that chore for you. So that's part of it. Um, other things can be actually prioritizing intimacy, right? It's really hard to do that. But think about, we prioritize everything. Lives. We prioritize brunch. We prioritize meetings that probably don't need to be meetings. We prioritize a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't need to happen. But we don't ever prioritize intimacy. And I'm not saying sex specifically because it doesn't always have to be penis and vagina sex, right? It can be being intimate. So what that could look like is scheduling instead of date night, scheduling intimacy time, right? So you drop the kids off, you have a babysitter, whatever it is. And the goal for that time is to connect intimately. So that could be cuddling together, that could be lying together naked, that could be whatever it is that you enjoy without the pressure of saying we're going to have sex. We're just going to be intimate. If sex happens, that's great. But then making that a scheduled thing and actually going through with it. And you think about like when you used to date when you were younger, right? Like you were excited to go on that date and you were like, oh, we might have sex. It's going to be fun. You didn't know there was going to be sex for sure, but you're like, we might. So I'm going to be prepared for it and I'm going to be excited about it. And so it's sort of the same thing. Like you, you go in with no expectations, except for the fact that you're going to connect with each other, not just go to dinner and talk, but actually physically connect with each other. Yeah. Um, a couple of great researchers. One of them was um, Robert Waldinger out of mm -hmm. Harvard. And, you know, he's the director, fourth director of the longest running longitudinal study on human longevity. Mm -hmm. And he found, and these are the questions, you know, I probe for like, what are those things? Because we have these romantic ideas about relationships, you know, and people, unfortunately, we don't understand like the day to day because it is, it's very ro romantic, all the messages that are brought to us. And there is a romantic aspect of it. But when you got real life stuff going on and challenges and different things happening in life and stressors, you know, uh, a lot of issues can start to, to fester. A lot of things don't get processed. And so one of the things that I asked him was, okay, we've got this romantic idea, like a great relationship. People are not like arguing and getting into, you know, scuffles and things like that with each other. He's like, no, that's not what our data shows. He was like, actually the couples that have the longest, healthiest, happiest relationships, he said, this was his term. He's like, they fought like cats and dogs. They're all, <laughs> you know, they're getting into little things, you know, messing with each other, whatever. But he said, there was a bedrock of intimacy. There's a bedrock of connectivity, right? And physical touch and just like having this intimacy throughout the day, yeah, right? So even if there's a conflict, you're just being able to be close to someone. And even if there's, by the way, sidebar without the, the conflict, you know, how often are you close to each other? Not necessarily yeah. again, having sex, but just being close. Yeah, even just touching each other, right? Like just putting a hand on the back or giving each other a hug or something intimate, right? That's where we talk about foreplay starts, like my husband jokes like foreplay starts at birth, like, cause you always say this, but it's like, yeah, it starts in a relationship, it's ongoing, right? So yeah, you're gonna have fights, you're gonna have issues, but the point is that you listen to each other, you respect each other, and that you prioritize the things that matter. And I think that those are so simple, right? Like when somebody wants to be heard, you just listen to them. And sometimes that's hard, right? Like you actually have to stop what you're doing. And we talked about this earlier, you actually have to listen and be present. And when you're busy and thinking about the towels or the laundry or the kids or whatever, you don't wanna listen necessarily, but you actually have to stop yourself and listen and prioritize that connection with your partner and respect each other. And like go back to those simple basic tenets that you sometimes take for granted when you're in a relationship. I mean, there's, there's certainly, you know, and there's value to it in longevity. Let's take it back to that, right? Being intimate, having 
close friendships, close relationships that you can rely on are going to help you overall in life. Yeah. I just, talking with you, it hit me for the first time, that concept of giving someone the cold shoulder, right? So that's mm -hmm. literally like you're not touching their shoulder, Yeah. right? That shoulder is cold. It's not getting any love. It's not getting that touch. And so that's what that really means. That's so fascinating. Um, also, there's a, a rise in issues related to, you know, things like PCOS, um, you know, estrogen dominance. There's all these different issues that are unfortunately uh, have skyrocketed really in recent years. And something that isn't talked about very much is low testosterone when it comes to women. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yes. So in fact, I will share my own personal anecdote. I recently checked my testosterone, not because I'm symptomatic, but because I have colleagues that were like, I'm on it. It's great. Like, you know, I feel so much better. And I was like, okay, I checked it. And it was like very, very low. So women have more testosterone in their bodies than estrogen. So in fact, it's our most dominant hormone in terms of sexual hormones. It is responsible for a lot of things. The one thing that's gets talked about most is sexual desire, but there's more to it. It helps with muscle mass. It can help with brain fog. It can help with lubrication to some degree. So there's a lot of benefits to having a normal level of testosterone. And when you go through the menopausal transition, even perimenopausal transition, your hormones tend to, your testosterone tends to decline more slowly than the others, but it is declining quite, quite a bit. And, you know, your estrogen goes down to like 1% and your progesterone goes down. Down. But the testosterone does continue to decline, and that can also manifest in low desire, difficulty gaining muscle mass in the gym, um, and, and a whole host of other things. So overall, it can be helpful to get that evaluated and tested to see if you are indeed on the low, uh, you know, physiologically low. Your level should be one tenth of a man's level, so it should be somewhere between uh, thirty and a hundred. Right. Whereas a man should be somewhere between 300 and a thousand, uh, depending on the lab test you're using, but around there. And so, you know, it is something that is not talked about. It is something that is not treated very often. Most people will, will, not, if you go to the pharmacy and you try to get testosterone as a woman, they like, look at you sort of funny, you're getting it for yourself, you know, but absolutely it can be treated. Um, and there's natural ways to boost testosterone as well. A lot of it can come from good sleep, getting a uh, good exercise. And that means like resistance training, not just cardiovascular training, but resistance training, heavy loads in the lower extremities, um, making sure you have a very unprocessed diet. I mean, the best studied one is the Mediterranean diet, but really whole foods, unprocessed foods, and, and then avoiding sort of endocrine disrupting chemicals in the environment. Now they're everywhere. They're ubiquitous, but I tell people control what you can, which means try to not drink out of plastic water bottles as, as much as possible. Try to not heat up your food in plastic. Those sorts of things are easy lifts, right? And so everyone can do those. Um, and so those are things that naturally can help boost it. But certainly if you are indeed low, talk to your doctor about supplementation. Awesome. So good. This is so good. Um, you said the S word. You said sleep. Yes. All right. And testosterone might be our most sleep dependent hormone, especially sex hormone. It absolutely is. And this study found that, you know, there's a direct correlation with how much sleep you're getting and your testosterone levels going up. It's basically like you know, going into a charging station at night for testosterone Absolutely. is filling up and it's kind of declining through the day. We can get some little boosts here and there again, like if we're exercising a mm -hmm. certain way, for example, but it's really sleep dependent. And this study, uh, and we'll, again, we'll put this up for everybody to see, found that this was young men. So college age men. So this, you know, early twenties, sleep depriving them for just a week mm -hmm. dropped their testosterone by 15%. Yeah, And that was likened to, because somebody might be like, well, 10, 15% it isn't that much. That's like them suddenly being 20 years older, 30 years older. And they did this in just a week by sleep depriving them. And this was, you know, versus getting around eight hours, which is a cookie cutter amount, but you know, five hours a night can absolutely destroy your testosterone production for men and women. Absolutely. And we're a sleep deprived society, right? We're the yeah. only, and Matt Walker says this, but we're the only species that deprives ourselves of sleep. 
Like every other species just goes to sleep. Part of it's probably because we're in a modern world, right? We have screens and all these things, but we will intentionally stay awake even when we're tired. And so it's not just the number of hours of sleep, it's the quality of sleep. So are you drinking a ton of caffeine before bed? Are you drinking alcohol before bed? Are you um, sleeping in a dark room? Like there's all these different things, right? That sleep experts will tell you, but they actually make a difference, right? And, and I think you have to sort of experiment and maybe caffeine, you're a fast processor, but the average person, and the average half-life of caffeine is five to six hours, which means if you drink caffeine at noon, then at midnight, you're still going to have, you know, a fourth of that caffeine in your body. So it's sort of like, you know, there's different things that you can tweak to optimize your sleep. But the first thing is just trying to get to bed at a reasonable hour and wake up at a reasonable hour. And they say that that first four hours is way more important than that last four hours of sleep. So getting that first good quality of deep sleep is, is really valuable. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And you'll probably notice again, if this has been an issue for you over the years, that once you put a little bit more intention into your sleep, you're probably going to find yourself being a little more frisky, yeah. you know, just that in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, you know? absolutely. And you'll feel a lot better. Facts. Facts. <laughs> Before we move on, I want to talk a little bit more about orgasm. Yeah. All right. And not just, again, we can look at this in a kind of a superficial lens, like, oh, that's good. You know, I want some of that. that want, <laughs> it's fun. It's, it's yummy, whatever the case might be. But why it's so good for our health. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, in, in the discussion earlier and talking about the clitoris, how much of that as far as maybe if the, is there a percentage on how, how much of like or, orgasm comes from clitoral stimulation versus other stuff? Absolutely. So let's start with that question because that's easier to answer, quicker to answer. So we know that about 85, 80 to 85% of women need some form of clitoral stimulation in order to achieve climax. Now, some of them will need it with vaginal stimulation or will like both, but 80, 80, 80 to 85% will need clitoral stimulation in order to reach an orgasm. And many women, that's the only way they can. And that's completely normal and completely okay. Um, so that's, you know, the thing. And I think a lot of people, because they're not taught that, don't know that, right? And so if you don't explore yourself or you don't tell your partner, you you may never have an orgasm. Yeah, and there are um, some men that are just like, what is a clitoris? Exactly. You know, like it, it, it is out there. All yeah. Right? And, you know, I teach, I used to teach medical students and you'd be shocked at how many medical students try to put a catheter into the clitoris and not the urethra, which is the P-tube. So even very educated, very smart people don't know. And so I think, cause you learn about it, right. But actually looking at it and seeing it in real life, um, it's, it's shocking, right? So that's really important. Uh, in terms of the health benefits of orgasm, there are many, right? So we know that it, it actually reduces, it brings your, once you're after the orgasm, your heart rate goes down, your blood pressure goes down, you have better mood, better sleep. So in the short term, orgasms are really good for overall those sorts of things. But we also know that orgasms in general are, you know, are related to, can, can also be effective in terms of reducing pain. So if you're having pain or discomfort, having an orgasm can often reduce your pain, you know, your pain or heighten your pain threshold. So that is valuable for sometimes people who may be having pain in their body somewhere. So there's a lot of benefits to having orgasms. And so when people talk about, um, you know, they sort of get get upset about masturbation. A lot of times that's the only way someone's getting an orgasm and they're, that's the only way they're reaching those benefits of orgasm. And so in my mind, you know, as long as you're, you're whichever way you're getting to orgasm, as long as it's healthy, meaning you're not spending an inordinate amount of time trying to achieve orgasm related to other things in your life. Right. And you're doing it with consent and you're doing it um, safely. It's great, you know, because there are so many benefits to orgasm. All right, let's, <laughs> I've been keeping it together. All right. <laughs> now I'm curious, obviously you, you talked a little bit about the different ways of stimulating the clitoris. Mm -hmm. What about, are there any ideal sexual positions that would 
maybe you know that would kind of automatically happen as well. There's a lot of positions out there yeah. on the streets, all right? <laughs> I remember I saw this like Kama Sutra poster <laughs> one time. It's just like, there's a lot of ways to do this. Yeah. But are there certain positions that can kind of just de facto stimulate the clitoris as well? So typically, and there's actually been data on this. So there's studies where they've looked at different positions. They've looked at like They've, they've given them names like rocking, angling, and, and a variety of different names. But essentially what they found is that with the woman on top, one that allows her to sort of net, position herself in a way that may allow for more clitoral stimulation. So that sometimes is, is more likely to lead to orgasm. The other one sort of like rocking or angling your body in such a way where you're penetrating, but also sort of stimulating the clitoris can be helpful. Sometimes these stimul these positions take some practice, right? Because it's sort of like you, some of them, you actually both have to move in a certain way. There's one called the coital alignment technique, which is like, you know, you're both moving in a rocking position and you're like positioned in a way where it's directly on top of the clitoris. And it actually takes a little bit of sort of, you know, coordination. And Very so dancing. you got to sort of practice, right? Patrick and like Swayze. figure, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you got to sort of practice and, and that's okay, right? Because if ultimately the goal is to have a enjoyable sexual experience, like, so what if one time sex is not so great? You're just trying to figure it out so that the next time can be even better. And I think that we put a lot of weight on like, oh, you have sex with one person one time and it sucks. It's not meant to be like, you know, I'd rather have bad sex and then amazing sex mm. than have have good sex once and then, you know, be like, oh, that's the one. And then the sex, the sex starts sucking because they stopped trying so hard, you know? Oh, wow. So hard. Trying so hard. <laughs> All right. I've been holding back on those. Okay. Let's shift gears now and talk about uh, men's sexual health a little mm -hmm. bit more. Um, you mentioned it being an indicator, you know, with erections, waking up in the morning, uh, the quality of the erection is probably a good indicator of some underlying health issues or that you're, you know, things are going well, circulation uh, being one of those key things. Something that we don't talk about much is the prostate. Mm -hmm. So what is the prostate? What is its function? Yeah. So the prostate is this walnut shaped gland. It sits around the urethra, which is the, the organ where it attaches the bladder where urine comes from and underneath the bladder. And so its function is mostly uh, in it for to support sperm health. So when sperm travels through the through the um, urethra to get to the female, that they're they're providing nourishment for that sperm, right? So it's really reproductive in nature. The prostate, however, grows in men and becomes a problem for a large number of men. So when you look at 80 year olds, 80% of them will have an enlarged prostate. Now that doesn't mean they all have problems, but very often you'll develop symptoms. And that will be things like having difficulty urinating, maybe, maybe straining to pee or waiting for your stream a long time to start or stopping and starting. Um, or on the converse, it can be your bladder can react to that enlarged prostate. You can have overactive symptoms like you got to go, got to go. Uh, you have to go often. You're waking up a lot at night. Um, you have this strong urge to go, but you can't wait. Like normally you get an urge and you can take your time to get to the bathroom, but sometimes that becomes more difficult. And so this is sort of an a very common problem, something that we as urologists see a lot of, but it's a real quality of life issue, particularly if you're waking up at night, right? Because what happens very often is you have someone wake up at night, it's dark, they trip over something, they fall, they break a hip, and then within a year, 20% of those people are dead in, in their old age. So it's really actually, even though it's a quality of life issue, it's a serious problem that can lead to real health sequelae. Um, and so it's, it's, it's an issue that a lot of men have, and there's treatments that you can do medically or surgically, and there's sort of, sort of preventative things. There's data on things you can do to prevent enlargement. Now, how successful it is depends on a variety of things, right? Your own genetic makeup. If you, if your dad had an enlarged prostate, it's very likely that you're also going to have an enlarged prostate and you may have symptoms even earlier, like in your forties, potentially. Um, but uh, the, the preventative things that tend to help are exercise. So actually there's good data on cardiovascular exercise about 150 minutes a week in terms of prevention of prostate enlargement. There's also um, dietary lycopenes, which have are, are basically like tomato is the big lycopene 
product that tends to have some benefit in terms of prevention for um, for prostate growth and maybe even prostate cancer, although it's not firmly, uh, it's not it's not widely recommended in terms of everyone doesn't need to eat lycopene products to, to prevent that risk. Um, and so those are some, some big ones. And then in terms of dietary intake, uh, protein intake can be helpful as well. Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Now, when you mentioned cardiovascular exercise, what about being on a bike a long time. Yes. Yeah, so the bike is great cardiovascular exercise, but when you're, it depends on the seat you're sitting on. And the reason I say this is because when you're sitting on a bike, it has usually a narrow beak and that beak is where you're sitting, your perineum or what, you, what people call the taint is putting all the pressure right there. That's where all the blood vessels and nerves are to your genitals. And so sometimes this can lead to people, one, having temporary numbness, right, of their genital area, but two, sometimes they can develop some issues with erections. Now, the data is not very strong in terms of there's some, it's mixed, but we do see it sometimes people who are chronic bike riders, they're seeing maybe some issues with sexual function because they're constantly putting pressure on the blood flow to the genitals. Now, I don't think anyone should stop bike riding if that's what they enjoy. Just get a bike seat that is better for distributing pressure around their perineum so that they're not having so much concentrated pressure in one area. I just saw, and I don't know if this is actually a real invention or not, but there was a, a new bike seat innovation where the bike seat shifts like with your booty cheeks as you're pedaling, like the huh. bike, one side of the bike seat goes up and goes down. So I don't know if that's a real thing, but hey, you know, we can yeah. figure this out. Um, now, as far as the health of the prostate, so is, is ejaculation good for the prostate? Yeah, so there's actually one very famous study that looked at the correlation in terms of numbers of times of ejaculation per month with men who developed prostate cancer. And they looked at this longitudinally over a long period of time, and they really tried to control for a lot of different factors. So like dietary intake and a whole host of different things that may affect risk of prostate cancer. And what they found was that men who ejaculated 21 times or more a month versus those who ejaculated you know, four to seven times a month had a lower correlation of having prostate cancer. So they were less likely to have prostate cancer than the other group. Now, does that mean that everyone should ejaculate 21 times a month? Not necessarily. We just know that those people who may be ejaculating more because maybe they have a more intimate relationship, they're having sex more often. Maybe they, um, you know, maybe they just are more healthy. And so they, they get can more ejaculate time on more, their right? hands. Who knows, right? But, uh, but, <laughs> but ultimately those people did have a lower risk. So, you know, the theory behind it is that, you know, you're sort of not having stagnant ejaculatory fluid sitting around in your body, right? It's getting out. You're kind of cleaning the pipe, so to speak. So, you know, there may be some, some benefit to it, but certainly there's no harm in it, right? So if you want to, you know, have a lot of sex or masturbate 21 times or whatever it is, like there's no harm in it, but do what feels good to you. I would not say meet some sort of benchmark, like, oh, I did only 20 times this month. Oh my God, I, you know, it's okay. Like you just, you know, you go with what you can, but don't, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to stop yourself. Mm, 21 Savage. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, wow. So with this being said, so, and I love that analogy of the pipes getting cleaned. Yeah. But what if you don't? I mean, you know, that's one of the things where, you know, there there's another camp of like, hold it in. Mm -hmm. Don't ejaculate. That's going to help you to live longer. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence to support that. Now there's certainly, you know, tantric sex practices that are really rooted in spirituality that have shown, you know, for them, they feel like they reach a higher spiritual, um, sort of being by abstaining. Now, I think we've translated that to modern society to think it's somewhat better. Now, I don't, if anyone feels they're getting some benefit from abstaining, by all means, go ahead. I don't want to shame anybody for their practices, whether they're masturbating or not, whatever that is, that's fine. But I would say that there shouldn't be, there's no evidence to support that abstaining is going to improve your longevity or or improve your testosterone or make you more fertile or any of that stuff. Right. So I think ultimately it's what you feel makes you more comfortable. Some people will report that they feel a lot better when abstaining. And by all means, if that's what you feel, go ahead. But for health benefits, we don't have any data to support that. Yeah. This is the first time where I thought more, you know, globally about the, the, the amount of times of ejacul ejaculation being 21 mm -hmm. and the other factors that 
influence something like that, right? So like the quality of your relationship, what other life factors might be going on that are influencing how much sex you're having or you know how many orgasms you're having? It's not just about that itself. Absolutely. And you know, it's just really fascinating. And so talking about male sexual health and erectile dysfunction has, oh my goodness, it's like, this is a multi-billion dollar industry now mm -hmm. uh, for pharmaceutical companies. There's all <laughs> kinds of stuff, um, but these are oftentimes Band-Aid solutions, right? Mm -hmm. So these are not treating the underlying cause of mm -hmm. the erectile dysfunction. So what is at the root? Why is erectile dysfunction on the rise? And you see, I said on the rise, <laughs> all right? I couldn't help myself. Erectile dysfunction is on the rise because of the rise of comorbidities, mm -hmm. right? We have more diabetes, more high blood pressure, more high cholesterol than we've ever had before. And you know this, you're a nutritionist, like this is routed in inactivity and poor nutrition, right? The large majority of these issues are coming from that. Now there's hormonal issues, um, certainly low testosterone is a very small percentage of reasons for men to have erectile dysfunction. It's about 3%. Mm -hmm. So when people are like very concerned about their testosterone, there are a multitude of benefits to testosterone, but just because you are low doesn't mean that, that fixing that is going to fix your erections all the time. And if you're not low, then there's probably some other reason that you're having issues. Now, there's also probably more psychogenic erectile dysfunction, meaning people are more stressed, more anxious. And so they're developing psychogenic ED. You think about it as a young guy. If you have an issue with an erection one time, that is so stressful, right? And then you go to your next encounter and you're stressed. Am I going to get an erection? Am I going to get one? Is it going to happen? Of course you don't because you're stressed. And then you're like, something's wrong with me, right? And then it's just, it's horrible. It's a horrible experience. And the other thing that's very infrequently talked about is pelvic floor dysfunction. And so that is, we all have a pelvic floor. It's these bowl of muscles that sits in our pelvis that holds everything up. It's actually a part of your core. And what happens is, is sometimes due to certain uh, stress, anxiety, due to um, sort of mobility uh, issues with the function of your pelvic floor, due to maybe trauma, due to maybe sitting for long periods of time, mm. we're seeing people develop what's called high tone pelvic floor. And what that means is your pelvic floor is essentially super tense. So it's like your bicep is stuck like this. Mm. And so one, it can't relax. And it also can't go through its full range of motion. It's sort of stuck here. So you could think that if this happened for long periods of time, you're now not getting good blood flow to your muscles. You're not getting good blood. You're getting pain maybe in your elbow, your shoulder, your wrist, a variety of different areas that are not even related to the bicep, right? Or not even directly related, right? So so similarly, when you get pelvic floor dysfunction, it can present in a whole host of different ways, one of which is erectile dysfunction. But it can also present with pain with erections, pain with ejaculation. It can present with maybe changes in sensation, constipation, back pain, hip pain. So a whole host of different things. But you know that is another thing that I'm seeing a rise of, particularly during COVID, I saw a lot of it because people were sitting and stressed. Um, yeah. And so- right. You know, that that's a big part of it. But so these are all the reasons that erectile dysfunction is becoming more common. And we're also living longer. So you're going to see more erectile dysfunction because 50% of 50 year olds are going to have ED, 60% of 60 year olds, 70% of 70 year olds, and so on and so forth. Holy moly. All right. Um, you know, this really goes back to something very practical, like our lifestyle and, you know, being chair bound and sedentary and the rising comorbidities and, you know, and for us, because, and then the, again, it's a vicious circle, right? Mm -hmm. It feeds back into itself. But the thing that stood out the most in that is the psycho social connection, right? Just mm -hmm. how much our thoughts influence our sexual function, because that's really what it is. It's based on our thoughts, our perception Absolutely. of things. And whether we're quote, turned on or not. And it can be, of course, like subconscious things happen on accident in, mm -hmm. in a way, of course. And, but still it's what's governing how your body's responding for men and women. And so really like, how are you dealing with the stress in your life? Like, what is your perception about your own well-being? And like you just said, like being 
you know, kind of having like a psychological turmoil based on a sexual experience, right? So my question is, the same thing holds true with men. What can we do to better manage our stress, to feel better about ourselves, to feel better about our bodies, and thus have better reactions? Yes. So I think when you're in a long-term relationship, it's a little easier because as long as your partner's on board, you can work together to sort of so, you know, step back, right? So if it's this, it's tr starting to like be present during sex, like we're talking about being present in a conversation, but it's also being present and enjoying the sensations, right? Like enjoying the feelings, enjoying this and not thinking about what your body's doing or not doing. And so very often when you see a sex therapist, the first thing they'll say is stop having sex and actually do something like sensate focus where you just get naked and you just touch each other and you just touch each other everywhere except the genitals. So now you're not focused on your genitals. You're just remembering what areas that you touch feel good and you're experiencing that. And then as you start feeling more confident with that, you then go to starting touching genitals. And then after you start feeling comfortable with genitals, you can then consider doing penetrative sex. But it's sort of like taking a stepwise approach to then get you back to feeling comfortable in those scenarios so that you're not thinking about, am I going to have an erection or not? And also sometimes just saying it, right? Like I'm worried about my erection. And if your partner is like, I don't care. Like if it, like, as long as they know it's not them that's causing you to lose your erection, then they're going to feel okay about it. Right. They want to, if you're like, I'm still committed to making sure you have pleasure and I still would like to have pleasure. Like then you guys can work through that together, you know? And I think that the big misconception comes from when people are not talking about it and they start feeling like, oh, it's me. They're not having an erection because it's my fault. And now uh. you feel embarrassed and then you're like, oh, I, you know, it's, this is not going to work or whatever the situation is. Wow. Yeah. This goes back to, you know, this has been a thread throughout this conversation, which is just talking. You yeah. know, having communication. It's so funny. Like we say this stuff in culture, you know, communication is the key, but really like actually, and I think this goes back to another issue, which is just having the time or creating the time, allowing the time for you to have that communication yeah. with all the craziness going on in life. And that's another thing that's lacking today for many couples. Um, I want to ask you about, so if getting an erection isn't the issue, but the quality, mm -hmm. right? If mm -hmm. people are wanting to improve the quality, and I would imagine this is rooted in having good blood flow. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the things that people can do to improve that the quality of their erection? Absolutely. So it's the same things that we talk about in general, right? What is good for your penis is good for your heart. What is good for your heart is good for your penis and good for your brain and good for like, you know, all the important organs, right? So exercise, eat right, those sorts of things. But Beyond that, so that's first and foremost, like don't go searching for treatments until you've fo like really fixed those problems, right? And then in terms of, you know, we talked about psychogenic issues. The other thing that I find that helps sometimes is giving someone a Band-Aid, right? Giving someone a low dose of uh, a Tadalafil, for example, a medication for erections, just so they can get their confidence back in terms of like, oh, I can get an erection and it's working great and things are great again. And like you get that confidence back and then you can go off it and see how you do, right? And so it sort of like helps break the cycle sometimes. And so that can be an option in terms of, you know, if you are seriously having psychological issues. Now, if you want the quality to be better, absolutely is things that improve blood flow, which would be increasing diet, increasing exercise. Over time, you're going to see that your erection quality is going to get better too. In fact, they did a study where they compared men who did exercise to men who took a Viagra, for example, and they saw the improvements were the same. So actually doing something completely natural, like working out or doing exercise doesn't have to be actually going to the gym, right? Any sort of form of exercise will improve erections. So that's one. Two is, you know, there are, of course, medications I've talked about that can help. And these work by essentially creating more blood flow to the erection. So they're band-aids. They're not fixing the issue. And nothing you take, at least orally as a pill right now, is going to reverse the issue. Even if you take a supplement or something like that, it's just increasing the the body's way of of getting blood flow to the area but the second you stop taking it it goes away right so those are sort of 
Um, and then there's other options, right, that are that are more invasive that I wouldn't recommend if you're just trying to improve the the maintenance of your erection, right? You have an erection already. I wouldn't probably go overboard. Now, in terms of things that are available that are, you know, sort of you're hearing about in terms of like reversing ED or increasing blood vessels in the penis, for example, one of these is shockwave. So it's using acoustic shockwaves to the penis that creates like this mechanical trauma to the erectile tissue that your body then sends growth factors in to create new blood vessels. And so basically it's responding to this trauma by actually then going in and sending growth factors to create more blood vessels. So this is actually in theory reversing the condition. Now this is a, um, still considered experimental in the United States. It's in the, Europe. It's accepted now as formerly in the guidelines. In the U.S., I think we're getting there soon too. We have about 10 years of data on shockwave therapy, specifically focused shockwave therapy, not radial shockwave therapy. And that has shown to improve erectile dysfunction in mild to moderate erectile dysfunction, meaning that you can either, your erection is not as great quality or you lose it too soon, or you maybe respond to medications um, but you can still get an erection. And so in that category of men who have problems with blood flow, not other issues, right? Not hormone issues, not uh, pelvic floor issues, not psychological issues, but specifically, they also have blood flow issues. You're seeing in that group of men where you're seeing about a 70% success rate at three months, meaning that people are getting better erections. And at a year that goes down to about 50%. So probably whatever is causing that blood flow vascular problem is continuing, even though you've done this. And so you probably, there's some maintenance that needs to be done. But ultimately that's the one I would say that has the best data because it has about a decade of research. Now there's other things that people will talk about like, uh, PRP injections and stem cells, where the data is pretty immature yet. And I would say that it's not um, not as compelling in multiple studies that's positive. So there's mixed reviews and stem cells has very little review. So I would say at this point, those are not things that I would say everyone agrees are pretty good, but they are, there are emerging areas. So this is something that we're looking at in terms of in urology and ways to reverse the problem rather than just use a bandaid. Wow. Uh, so be weary of injecting something in your, in your wiener right now. Yeah, right. unless it's a unless it's a specifically an intracavernosal injection of a medication to induce erections given to you by a doctor. So that is a treatment option for men with erectile dysfunction. So usually if you don't respond to oral options, that's another option that you can use. But only those things. Don't inject anything to make your that's off market that you get from, you know, another country. I would not recommend that. Now with this, I'm curious about the shockwave. Uh, treatment. So is this utilizing sound or Acoustic, is this utilizing yeah, sound? Okay. Mm -hmm. This is speaking to a whole, well, this isn't, it's not new, but just this domain of medicine that we just kind of, we, we hear it, but we don't, that's, we hear it. <laughs> we hear it, but we don't really hear it, which is sound is used in medicine. It's been used for thousands of years, mm -hmm. but uh, in modern medicine for all kinds of different treatments, right? We use ultrasound, for example, to uh, do imaging, to accelerate healing. There are certain sound treatments that have been found to help to break up you know, kidney stones mm -hmm. and cancer tumors, the list goes on and on, but using it as a healing modality, even for something like sexual dysfunction, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, the, the research that is coming out in this area is really fascinating. And that's, that's probably the most mature, like I said, in the regenerative, regenerative space. But I think ultimately there's more interest in this because pe this is what people want. They don't want a band aid, right? They want to have something fix the problem. And while there's no quick fixes, right, but this is something that may help. And if you say you're like doing a life transformation, you're, you know, changing your diet, changing your exercise, and you do this, and, and maybe you don't need anything after that, right? So I think it really sort of um, is, is a potential option that could be really beneficial for some people. This is so awesome. <laughs> You know, I'm learning so much, you know, just spending time with you and, um, you know, following you on social media. You have a fantastic YouTube channel as well, sharing this information and so many other topics that come up. Like you seem to have these these topics that, again, it's just like really patient driven, right? Mm -hmm. Things that people might be scared to ask yeah. or they 
you know, might ask this and get a very superficial answer because, uh, you know, um, uh, the physician might not be able to spend the time to deconstruct certain things. Can you let everybody know where they can follow you and just get more information, hang out in your universe? Absolutely. So I'm Rena Malik, MD. You can find me on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. Um, I also have a podcast, the Rena Malik, MD podcast. So feel free to find me on any of those platforms where I'm teaching people about sexual health. This has been fantastic. And I was just saying, I've got like 20 other topics that I want to ask you about. So we definitely have to have you back again. And I just appreciate you so much for deciding to turn that camera on and to start sharing this content and information with people. It's a big part of our lives. And, you know, it's just unfortunately not a lot of uh, education about this. And um, I just really do appreciate it because you saying yes to doing that is helping so many people. So it's pretty Thank amazing. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. We found that like many of our most stable couples fought like cats and dogs. So it wasn't the amount of arguing you did. It was whether you could see a bedrock of affection and respect, even when people were arguing.